Welcome to uh, this afternoon's session. Uh, we have the great fortune of having uh, Paul Bennett from IDEO. Uh, my name is Paul Bishop. I've been an actor for about 25 years in the sustainability space. I've been focusing around that the last few years. And it was in 2008 that I did a, uh, an IDEO workshop at the Oxford Skoll World Forum on, uh, for social entrepreneurship about um, uh, social, it was about using empathy as a tool for social change. And it was an amazing opportunity last year at the AP Unlimited um, uh, Design Festival to be a participant in the Food Futures Workshop, which was facilitated by um, Paul Bennett. And um, many of you will have met him. For those of you who don't know, IDEO is a human-centred design and innovation organisation that does some of the most astonishing um, uh, design work uh, and innovation around the world. And it's just a great thing to have them in this space, and I'd like to welcome for you this afternoon, Paul Bennett. Hello, Australia. Let me start with um, the miles that I've travelled, as well as the miles that all the pollen in the universe seem to have travelled with me to conspire <laughs> to make me sound like this today. So if you notice this vague grandma -y smell coming from the front here, that's my throat lozenges that I'm going to be popping throughout the course of this. So, hello slash good day. Um, so, I want to start with a quote that I used last time I was here. Don't worry about the world coming to an end today. It is already tomorrow in Australia. I've always loved that quote. And I think it's particularly pertinent right now. Because I think it's fairly good that it is tomorrow. And the reason why... is because yesterday kind of sucked, right? You guys have had a rough time since I was last here, flooding agriculture. But, <sighs> deep breath. We have a great phrase in the UK. I think it was actually Winston Churchill who said this the first time. Never waste a crisis. So I think this is actually a really interesting moment, and Tom talked about the same thing from the stage earlier. This is a really interesting moment. This is an inflection point from which you can move forward in a very positive way. So I think you have the opportunity to collectively rebuild, rethink, and redesign. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. So essentially, I want to talk about two things in this presentation, some of which you will have seen before if you came to the talk I gave the last time, and some new stuff. I want to talk about how design can help with the process of both economic but also emotional regeneration. Design is about optimism. Design is an optimistic force. We do what we do because we're excited about doing it and we believe that doing it is the right thing to do. It is also a deeply pragmatic tool. Design is about making shit happen. And that's been the theme of the workshop that we've just been running in, in here with a bunch of you, I think, have been here for that which is how do we take this kind of ethereal thinking and these amazing concepts that Tom talked about earlier and make them real. So I think pragmatism is one of the threads I want to talk about here. Second thing I want to talk about is the sort of respective roles that you as citizens, and hopefully you, if there's people here from the government, the government can play in that regeneration. It's a collaborative action that you can join together to create stuff happen, to make, sorry, to make stuff happen and to a certain extent to transcend the political agenda and get into a larger agenda, what I would describe as the, sort of the agenda of optimism. So I want to share some examples of some of the work that we've been doing around the world, and I want to give you some sort of ways in to start to make this stuff happen. And these are questions that we're finding ourselves kind of increasingly brought into, which is really exciting around the world. So, I want to start with a story. I think I might have told you guys the story this last time, for those of you that hadn't heard. I'll tell you again. This is the House of Commons in Parliament in the UK. I was asked to speak there. It was kind of terrifying. The biggest thing was what the hell to wear, to be really honest with you. I was terrified about how I was supposed to look there. Um, and there was a group of us were brought in, and very, very important people. One guy announced to the crowd that he was fixing Estonia, which I thought was very major sounding. Um, and so everybody went around and they introduced themselves, and um, I said, I'm a designer. And this politician guy, I guess somewhere up here, said, so why are you here? And I said, I have no idea. Let me tell you what I do. 
And they said, we talk to real people, we go out into the world, we get into real people's lives, we listen to them, we ask them questions, we collaborate with them on making stuff happen, and we bring those ideas out into the world. And there was a quite a long pause, and somebody about three or four rows in the back said, I think that's what we're supposed to do as well. <laughs> Let me tell you about IDEO. I'm here with my colleagues, you all saw Tom, Hyann and Mina are both here from Open IDEO, and I'm Paul Bennett. I want to start with a story. Many of you may have seen this already, but I want to go through this quickly. We believe firmly in the power of real people and creating with them. So I want to tell you a story. This is my first IDEO project. We were hired by a large healthcare system in the Midwest of America to help them identify the answer to this question. What is our patient experience? They'd worked, worked with a large consulting firm, and they had received a 749-page document in response to this. We called it the doorstop because our air conditioning broke, and it, we used it to hold the door open. Um, and the document looked like this. And like this. It's awesome, right? Gripping, page turner. Um, and there was page after page of page of analytics. And so they essentially said to us the following two things. Is this any good? And what do we do with it? So two weeks later, in response to this question, we went back and we sat in the boardroom of the hospital and we played a seven and a half minute of the seven and a half minute version of this. The CEO was slightly pissed, to say the least. He said, what are you doing? And we said, well, you asked us the question, what is our patient experience? This is Christian, he works at IDEO. He lay in a hospital bed for an entire day and did what you do if you're a patient in the healthcare system. He lay in a gurney, people talked about him like he was dead. He stared at a set of polystyrene ceiling tiles for several hours and watched the fluorescent lights go zzzz. Well, various people said things like, is he yours? I don't know. <laughs> so organizations, when faced with the question, what is our patient experience, or what is our experience generally, usually forget the most important piece, people. They solve it from the organization in, and they forget to solve it from the person out. British phrase that we use a lot, blinding glimpse of the bleeding obvious. The answer is at the end of your nose. So with this, we had a set of workshops, very similar to the one yesterday, where we sat with patients, nurses, doctors, healthcare people in the system, and we co-created. They looked and felt like this. <coughs> no idea what they're doing, creating something. Not important. What was important was that we weren't designing this, we were facilitating them designing it. <laughs> so, a series of solutions came out of this. This was designed by a patient and by a nurse. This is a tiny bicycle mirror taped with a piece of cardboard onto a gurney. It is a rear view mirror, so that if you're being wheeled around like Christian was, people can have a conversation with you and check that you're not dead. This was a nurse here who was frustrated by the fact that she was constantly being asked for pe by people where to go. So she designed this sort of Beyonce-esque wayfinding outfit for herself that let everybody know that there was a role that was required here, was a guide. A patient said, I don't want my room to look like the corridor, because the corridor is where, is where people are left, and I want my room to be different. So they actually implemented this, and they changed the floor surface between the common area and the private area. And then my favorite idea, we've all seen whiteboards all over the place in most, many of our offices, was to put whiteboards in the hospital rooms so that when people came in and if you were ill or if you were asleep or if you were sick, your kids could say, hey, mom, came and see you. Now, I'm not going to stand here as a designer and go, awesome design. Of course it isn't. It's, sort of, it's basic design, but it's awesome connection between human beings. And that, to me, is very, very powerful. So we took this into the formal design process. We did nice renderings of basically the same ideas. We did a customer journey framework strategy thing. Great. And they implemented 35 ideas in less than five months. The simplest ideas imaginable. One of the ideas that they took straight in 
was, I've got a clicker now, I'm excited about that, is they took a Polaroid of people when they came into the hospital, so suddenly you were dealing with a person and not with a patient. So this tiny mind shift suddenly, 35 tiny little ideas all connected to create a human set of human experiences, not a set of database numbers on a page. I want to show you another example. Bank of America in the US came to us and asked us to help them do the following. This is a kind of dry client brief. Develop a new path for revenue growth by tailoring products and services for boomer women with kids. Right? Basically, help us figure out new ideas. Right? So, I'm not a big believer in focus groups. We're not big believers that somebody's going to sit there in a fluorescent lit room at 7 o'clock at night and talk about the future of cornflakes and give you anything particularly insightful. I'm a big believer that alcohol and pizza are an enormous unlock to get really, really insightful things out of people. Um, so we had a series of dinner parties. We call them wine and dines. We invited a bunch of women along, and we had a series of conversations in a kind of fluid and, and um, interactive way. Two, em two insights emerged. One, the idea of saving was very important to people, but they didn't really care about how much money they had in their savings account. It was less about how much you saved and more that you saved. So saving was quite an emotional act. The second insight is this one here. This lady in California was paying her energy bill for Pacific Gas and Electric. She owed them $27.40. She wrote a check for $30. We said to her, mm, kind of interesting, why did you do that? Mental arithmetic. It's simple, right? You just round it up to the nearest dollar. OK. Continued the conversation, and we said, really? Is that it? She said, well, they owe me money now. <laughs> Shift of power. And we thought, this is kind of interesting, rounding up, mentally rounding up and sort of emotionally rounding up. We've all seen the act that we do it ourselves. We take the coins out of our pocket at night and we chuck them on the side. There's this notion of sort of ambient behavior, which we do all the time, and we thought there was something quite interesting. Could we build a service around that? So we created 42 concepts. This is number 12. Go into a store and buy a cup of coffee for $1.50. Pay for it with your Keep the Change debit card. Bank of America rounds it off to $2. Bank of America transfers 50 cents from your checking to your savings account, matches 5% of the annual total up to $250. Sliding the money from one account into another, ambient savings. We did not do this. This is a totally sucky piece of advertising, but it does somehow, in a non-metaphorical way, communicate the concept of a penny jar that is now a credit card that was a penny jar. The statistics themselves, so they launched this in less than seven months. The statistics are powerful. This is now three years in. 12 million customers, 3 billion saved, 93% awareness in, sorry, customer retention, and 95% awareness in customer base. This is Bank of America's most successful service ever. So everybody is always obsessed with big ideas. What's the big idea? Blah, blah, blah. Has to disrupt the universe, has to alter the structure of the universe on a molecular level. That's what we want. I actually think that's very overrated. I think this is a very small idea that is actually very well executed. And so there's this whole conversation, we have a lot of idea about what's a big idea, what's a small idea. A small idea, well executed in record time, is a very big idea to us. So what we do is not rocket science. It's not algebra, it's not calculus. It's people as inspiration, it's co-created, it's prototyped and iterated, and it's impactful on multiple levels, whether it's personal, economic, social, and environmental. That is design thinking in a nutshell. This is the enemy. <laughs> it, it don't come from here, folks. I have a client, Esco Aho. Tom Hume is looking daggers at me because he loves his spreadsheets. Um, I have a client in Finland, Esco Aho, who's the head of corporate social responsibility for Nokia. He used this great line. The future can't be designed in Excel. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with spreadsheets. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with rigor in a business context. But starting here and figuring out how to make money never works. You have to figure out what people need, and you have to design based on that. So that is how we, that is how we function. So these are design and mathematics. And this has been the theme of the entire workshop that we have just run. Small times many equals big. Divided by simple and tomorrow the answer. And that is essentially how we do everything that we do. And that's the process by which we've just run this workshop. But it's the process by which we're doing most of our work right now. How small can you start? 
the bigger the problem, and we are being asked to solve some whoppers. Purpose, poverty, peace, dignity, survival, sustainability, recovery, energy. Look at these things. These are all actual things that we're trying to figure out right now. The really big, hairy issues are the things we're being invited to solve. And for us, it's about how small and how simple can you start in answering that. I'll give you some examples. Center for Disease Control came to us in Atlanta and said, tweens and obesity. Obesity is one of the areas that we are now more involved in than almost anything else, I think. Obesity is at crisis level throughout the world. I came from Chicago last week where I was running a summit for a client of ours, trying to get them to understand obesity. This is one of the topics that keeps coming back. Where do we start this conversation? American teens and tweens and obesity. The first thing we did was went out and talked to American tweens and teens about obesity. It's a small piece of film. A lot of grease. I want to show this example because it's really, really interesting. When we say in a brainstorm, no idea is too stupid or too small, everybody always thinks we're joking. This is an idea from a brainstorm that came out of this project, which is, wouldn't it be awesome if we got the White House to plant a vegetable garden? Which they did. So the CDC was part of this process, and we ended up getting involved in this kind of conversation. So the leap now, from post-it note to policy is really powerful. And for the government folk in the room, I want to make this point several times. The speed with which these things are happening from seed of an idea to executed policy is now really exciting for us. There is this accelerated rate of change going on. I was at the government of Singapore a couple of weeks ago, and the entire conversation revolved around speed and agility. Tom talked about the Egypt revolution. I'm going to talk about the same kind of stuff. 48 hours later, suddenly it's a different world. So speed is one of the most important things now in all of these conversations for us. So from post-it note to policy. I got, an e I got a voicemail on my phone. and This guy said, hi, this is the office of President Obama. I thought it was somebody joking. I thought it was somebody kidding with me. And we ended up having a conversation with the Obama administration, who we're now working with fairly extensively in California. Peru came to us, or actually one of the um, NGOs that's working in Peru, and asked us if we could help them get the average Peruvian citizen to engage more deeply in the democratic process. Peruvian citizens are highly disengaged from politics at local and national levels. Huge corruption, as one would imagine, low engagement, fear of, of repercussion, don't know how to start. That was one of the things we heard again and again going out into rural Peruvian communities, talking to Peruvians and understanding what their problems were was the first thing that we did. Youth particularly, very, very interesting. One of the big insights, of which there were about three or four, was people just need the most simple, tiny way to engage. One of the first things we did, and probably one of the most effective things we did, was we created a sticker campaign. And this said, fix this. And these were passed out all over Peru. And basically everything from a police station to a broken table in a school was covered in stickers. My favorite quote was somebody said, can you do one that I can stick on a person? <laughs> so the tiniest piece of paper was a political act. So we created a whole series of these ideas. Are you going to stay seated? Let's act now. In the, in the favelas. Bring light here. Build a school here. Plant a tree here. Bring water here. Let's act now. Don't let your vote end here. Let's act now. Change is not out of reach. Let's act now. And this one I really like. Politics is not over your head. Let's act now. So we went out in town squares, we tested ideas, we had a series of conversations, it was really good. 
One of the things, and I, think I presented this the last time I was here, to everybody was really into this idea, so I brought it back. One of the executions that I absolutely love of this campaign is the idea of taking over municipal buildings that are already trusted institutions, so schools and libraries, and painting murals on the front of them that actually transcribe campaign promises. And as the politician meets the promise, you get a tick. I said I was going to do it, tick. So talk about public accountability. This is absolutely fantastic. So the idea of kind of publicly declaring what it is that you're going to do was something that we ended up executing. This is a new one. This is a really interesting challenge. This is a Somalian flag, and it's a piece of graffiti in Minneapolis. So we recently asked to help 29,457 Somalian community members integrate more meaningfully into the twin cities of Minnesota, Minneapolis and St. Paul. So when you hear the phrase Somali, and you're in Minnesota, you immediately think this, terrorists, jihadists, pirates. These were direct quotes from consumers. So there was a real fear of this culture, a real lack of comprehension of this culture, and of course a real bias towards this culture. The reality is, that's not true at all. This is one of six Minnesotan Somalian Boys League football teams. These guys are just like everybody else, as one would imagine, trying to live the American dream. Not jihadists or pirates or terrorists, of course. So we went away and did a series of interviews, had a series of conversations with both Minnesotan and Somalian Minnesotan members in the community and in government, and kind of came to one very simple conclusion. These guys think of themselves as Minnesotan Americans. They're just like everybody else. So we kind of figured out, wouldn't it be interesting if we could start to blend these two cultures together and create ways for them to have a conversation that were the things they shared. One of the ideas, I absolutely love this, one of the first things that we did was use food as a connective mechanism. Somali, and so I, for all of those of you been food futures, and we've had two days of discussing food trucks, look was to start to create a brand that brought Somalian food to the masses and Somalian food traditions to a Minnesotan and actually get Minnesotan and Somalian food to mash together. So this is a funny idea. In Minnesota, is anybody here from Minnesota? Because it would be fucking awesome if you were. Is anybody here a Minnesotan? I suspected not. Minnesotans love meat on a stick, right? It's a classless tradition around the world, I know. So they love their kind of meat-on-a-stick products, right? So this lady here decided to do a Somalian spin on meat-on-a-stick. Camel on a stick. I am not, I shit thee not, this is true. So camel on a stick was launched in food trucks along with Minnesotan fafa soup, which is actually chicken soup but spun in a Somali style. So again, bringing American and Somalian food traditions together. Camel on a stick among the Minnesotan State Fair's new hits this year. So suddenly we're connected through food. Very, very simple. So again, getting these communities together, joining people wherever you can, understanding the overlaps and executing it simply and quickly was what we did here. This is a campaign that's running right now. Minnesotan, you betcha. I can't do that with the Fargo voice that it would be required to make that make sense. But Minnesotan people who just happen to have come from Somalia. Neighbors for nations. And again, creating these ecosystems where we're bringing together local picture submissions and contribution from the community, support from the, from the local council, Somalians feeling good about the whole thing and executed out into the media. Highlighting when a business is actually Somali, rather than pretending that it isn't, actually calling out the fact that this is a Somali-American business. So this launched a couple of weeks ago to Greater Plum. Here we all are on the Minnesotan town hall steps, and here we all are integrating. Really nice story for us. We're really excited about this one. Tom and I went to Greece and met with Papa, Mr. Papandreou here. Poor soul, Greece in economic freefall, difficult times there. Um, did a presentation, the only time I've ever quoted Aesop and Plato 
in a presentation without it being kind of ironic and them thinking it was awesome, so that was sort of hilarious, um, and helping Greece understand how to start the process of economic regeneration and where could we start together. Um, so asking them essentially how could the place where philosophy was invented reinvent its own philosophy. Um, this is one of my favorite things of all time, um, is they've asked us, and we're about to start figuring out how to do this together, they've asked us to help them create this, Innovation Islands, um, which is Greece has obviously a natural asset, which is its geography, um, and Tom Hume, who is smiling because he knows I'm going to say this on stage, actually went off about Greece's natural geography and how great it was that they had all of these rocks that were connected because that was kind of the internet before the internet was born or some incredible abstract theory and the Greeks were like, okay. Anyway, <laughs> it, was very, it was very cool. Um, so they've asked us to help them do this. Take progressive islands and prototype new forms of governance, healthcare reform, education, enable mayors to become designers of their own community. So starting to take micro-communities, in this case an island, and prototype some of these new things and reframe the role of the government official from kind of top-down to design enabler. Very excited about this process, very excited about the idea of this as a kind of geographic prototype for us. A Couple more, then I'll talk about you. Dubai, went to Dubai did a TED talk in Dubai. Um, what's your dream for Dubai? Ask this question, sort of similar to what I'm talking about today. Today's presentation is about you designing your future. How will countries be designed in the future? Fascinated by this conversation, and I will come into this specific threat, train of thought about this for Australia in a second. Had a series of conversations, awesomely accessorized, by the way. Had a series of conversations with men and women there, really empowering, really exciting stuff that was going on. We created, a th we created a space for them called the DED, the Dubai Economic Development Board, which is a place where young Emirati entrepreneurs can come and figure out how to start their own businesses, where they can come together, where they can share, where the processes of starting a business can actually be, be helped manifest, and where they can come together and, and join, join um, their thoughts. This, of course, being the Middle East, they went from concept to actually building it in, I think, less than five months. It was like four and a half months. They literally took our sketches and just built them. So here it is built. Um, and what's really, really nice is stuff like this is starting to happen. These guys are the wild pita boys. They call themselves the Starbucks of shawarma. Um, and they are two sort of cute little um, Emirati guys that have an awesome, all the chicks love them. They have this huge Twitter following. And they tweet out all of their flavors of the day and everybody follows them. And they have this sort of rock and roll sandwich brand. And they are kind of an iconic example, I think of the Middle East's desire to create its next generation of leadership and to create its next generation of business thinking. So again, I'm, one of the themes that we're seeing, I think you saw it as I projected, that we're very interested in is entrepreneurship. Something we've been talking about here is creating the next generation of entrepreneurship leaders, entrepreneurial leaders. We're doing it in almost all of our locations. Very interested to understand what that means here. Tom talked, about, um, Tom talked about big conversations. He and I started on that very early journey together. It was quite fun. The first challenge we hosted was around the country of Iceland. I'm going to present this as a failure, because one of the themes that I'm kind of interested in is the notion of celebrating failure, because failure is something that terrifies people in a lot of these constructs. I'm going to present to you, I think, one of my biggest failures. We were hired, or well, we were asked by the government of Iceland to help them go there at the end of the economic crisis that they just gone through and help them understand how to innovate. There I am, never wasting a crisis. There I am on Icelandic TV with this guy here who grilled me live about what on earth we thought we could do to help a country like this. We went and met the president, we met the prime minister, we met everybody, you name it, I was in all these conversations. We went out to local regions, we met the local people. There was a, I, got, I became Icelandic, I was passionate about this project and I was passionate about making it happen. We presented a very simple project and a very simple way in, very similar to what I'm talking to you guys about. How do we give people a shared vision for a future Iceland? This completely confused the Icelandic government. It was way too simple. They were obsessed at the time with something called spiral dynamics. That to this day, I have to say, as, a, as somebody that prides himself on being moderately intelligent, I have no fucking clue what this thing is, right? It's some doomsday scenario planning tool that says things like, if a meteor was to descend from space tomorrow, what would that mean for the future of Iceland? So it's this sort of extreme scenario planning tool that seemed incredibly abstract. And so I remember thinking, OK, this is not really us, but we'll, we'll, we'll sort of watch what happens here. I was in my hotel that night, 
and this was going on outside. 60,000 Icelanders who were losing their homes and their jobs were outside banging pots and pans in frustration because they had no other way to vent the fact that their country was dying. Broke my heart, and I heard this phrase several times, they are fiddling while our country burns. So complexity of process seemed to trump simplicity and execution. And I felt that we completely failed these guys, and I still to this day say this, we completely failed them because we couldn't get the government to understand that simplicity was the only way to go. I, stu I stood in Parliament and railed on this, and we couldn't get action to happen. So it's quite frustrating. Last couple of things, and I'm going to go to Australia. So for us, we're not actually bothered about who owns the solution. As Tom said, all of our collaborative stuff is very genuine for us. If you genuinely care about the problem going away, you can't try to own the solution anyway. So we are increasingly giving our stuff away. This is the Human Centered Design Toolkit. I think about 45,000 of these have now been downloaded. We're giving the methodology by which we do all of these things away for free. C completely explains all of our tools, all of our techniques, all of our methods. We're doing it now for educators. There's one just gone up a few weeks ago about doing this in the space of education. Same thing. So we're increasingly expanding what we design as well as how we design it designing for people, as Tom said, to designing with them, and at increasing scale. I'm not going to take you through this, because I think Tom explained this enough. This was the beginning of Open IDEO, was where we saw Jamie Oliver at TED talking passionately about the fact that he wanted to do something for American school children to get them to eat better. So the first challenge that went on to Open IDEO, how can we raise kids' awareness of the benefits of fresh food so they can make better choices? was the early gestation of what you now saw Tom present today. So we went through, and in 98 days in 166 countries, 7,500 users created 584 inspirations, 198 concepts, led to 17 winning concepts. And it's continued. You saw Tom's collaboration map, so I won't explain that much more. So again, this highly collaborative mechanism is really inspiring us. And somebody asked me when I was on stage last time, here, how can you give it away? What does that mean for you as a professional designer? I say again, I've never been more inspired as a professional designer in my life. The stuff blows my mind on a daily basis. You have to let go of your ego, and you have to embrace this world. So this is going on all over the world, as Tom said, and the challenges are increasingly exhilarating. Education, technology, environment, and of course, here we are. So I was working on a concept the other day with this gentleman's work, David Stocks, a celebration of imperfection. I got very passionate, as anybody who will be in the room with me knew, about taking on the ugly food of the world and making it and celebrating it. I was defending the ugly strawberry and championing the ugly banana. And with a team of people, we got very excited about taking this amount of goodwill and turning it into something powerful. Hayan is here today, We've just recently launched the Open HCD Toolkit online. This is coming out in a couple of weeks. So again, these tools now, the toolkit at one end, Open ID at the other, these worlds are now starting to combine for us. Australia. And the last thing about us is we recently launched IDEO.org, which I think many of you have heard about, which is a way for us to engage with the nonprofit world, social enterprises and foundations to get solutions to market faster, and increase their impact and effectiveness. So essentially, now we're able to take grant money and grant funding to actually substantially undercut our own prices to be able to get more impact more quickly out in the world. So we're focusing on three areas, healthcare, sanitation, and microfinance. So that's us now, the world. Government, what are we hearing again and again? from people around the world about what this looks like. The first thing is this. Money can't buy me happiness. Governments are obsessed with GDP. Which kind of makes sense, right? The more a country makes, the wealthier the citizens, the happier they are. I guess that kind of makes sense. Ask Libya how they feel about that. Number 84 in the world in terms of GDP, way ahead of other countries with far stabler governments and democracy systems, and yet we have acute GND, gross national dissatisfaction. So one question keeps emerging again and again, I've already mentioned it on this stage. 
How will countries be measured in the future? How are we going to measure what good looks like? This is the GDP of Greece. Not good. GDP is important, but it can't be the only metric of a country's success looking forward. So what other things can we start to look at? Bhutan, of course, gross national happiness. It's nice. GNH. Lots of people are starting to look at happiness as a platform. Some global happiness index that I downloaded off the internet the other day. Most happy, least happy. Okay. Estonia. This is a lovely story. Three young Estonian tech entrepreneurs decided that their country was a mess. It was covered in rubbish, literally on the floor. So they geotagged 500 garbage dumps all over the country, and on Twitter and Facebook, they sent out a message, come and tidy up the country. 50,000 people on a Saturday afternoon cleaned to the entire country for free. Contribution is the new consumption. Is it innovation? Denmark's on an innovation jag at the moment. Let's be innovative. Fantastic. They've opened, they've opened a Danish innovation center in San Francisco. Is it bravery? The Middle East is super brave. If, it's gonna, if they can make it bigger, they'll make it twice as big as the next guy. So there's something about this idea of being pioneers, of being brave, that's kind of interesting to measure. This one I absolutely love. Have we all heard about this thing? Um, Carl and I were talking about this at dinner last night. Have we all about heard about this law that Bolivia has just passed, making nature actually a citizen? This is the, from their policy. The right to life to ex and to exist, the right to continue vital cycles and processes free from human alteration, the right to pure water and clean air, the right to balance, the right to not be polluted, and the right to not have cellular structure modified or genetically altered. They've given nature a right. Brave. For Bolivia, rock and roll. <laughs> is it connection, like Tom talked about? Is it connection like Facebook? And I think whatever it is, it has to inform decisions. I mean, I would argue that Bhutan drive quality of citizen life over GDP. So here we are towards Q2. I read this document end to end. What does this mean for Australia? And specifically, what, does, what could this mean for Queensland? Is it optimism? I've always thought that Australia is an incredibly optimistic place. I talked about it last time. I think Australia is an optimistic culture. Could you measure your optimism? Is your optimism something that you could be declarative about? Next question, as Tom talked about this as well. How can I be living in a democracy if I'm not even informed? We are officially now in the age of transparency. You have no choice. Everybody is a conspiracy theorist. You have to tell the truth. And if they don't hear it, they make it up, and it's much worse. So you have to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. And it's not just about forming, informing people of what you've decided, it's explaining to them how you decided it in the first place. So we have all kinds of transparency tools. Here's Obama's transparency in open government. I love this quote from the Huffington Post about the Bush administration. The last administration was clearly not interested in feedback, and look where that got them. We have all of these kind of portals opening. This is the state of Missouri, the Missouri Accountability Portal. What a map to your tax dollars. How are we spending your money? Is gov.loop, again, helping people decode what a policy is, what kind of policies affect them, what it means for them on a local level, and who is doing what. So again, completely in the realm of the public. I love this. Where did my tax dollars go? I made five thousand dollars and I filed a single click here's the entire map fifty thousand dollars I beg your pardon fifty thousand dollars this is how it was spent here's the breakdown you can go around this entire pie chart and every single aspect of this is broken down for you it's lovely number three this is one of my personal things talk to me in a way that really resonates like a person not like a citizen people cannot engage with you if they don't understand what the hell you're talking about ask David Cameron David Cameron created this thing called The Big Society, which was an attempt to create some kind of coalescing feeling of, of a love about the British people and their own communities. Of course, calling it The Big Society was probably the first mistake. And he got about 50 million people that tweeted things like, The Big Society sounds like something from fucking George Orwell, Doomsday. <laughs> and that was probably one of the kinder ones. Nobody wants to be part of a big society, correct? Everybody wants to be part of a small community. So again, good intention, horrible execution. 
So you have you know, these incredibly transparent forums opening up all over the place. This is Innocent. Innocent is a fruit smoothie brand in the UK that has their AGM as an annual grown-up meeting. And everybody sits on the floor in the whole company, and they talk about everything, and everything is live on YouTube as they're doing it. Complete transparency. Number four, engage me, don't govern me. The paradigm has completely shifted. People don't expect government to have all the answers. As Tom said, in a democracy, they want to contribute, they want to participate, and they want to share responsibility for decision making. So there's a thousand tools out now that allow people to do that, whether it's Facebook at a, at a personal level, whether it's brands inviting you into the conversation. This is one that we did. What global challenge do you think innovation leaders should work to solve right now? or whether it's, this is again from the US government, challenge.gov, a place where the public and government can solve problems together. Last couple, I want a positive experience, not some yawny process. Innovation shouldn't feel like that. It's not hard. Innovation should feel like the workshop that we've just spent 48 hours doing. It should be participatory, celebratory, creative, expansive and fun. This is how ideas of the future are going to be born. And as Tom said, I think the convergence of all of these different people, we had farmers talking to students, we had government talking to private sector, we had small talking to big, and everybody was joining together around creating something of value. He's a farmer. He's awesome. This is Ray. And then at the end of this, we decided rather than just all end, we actually did a blog, and we talked about the idea of collective inspiration. And we asked everybody that participated in the workshop to take the stickers, so back to Peru, the smallest thing possible. We put, printed a sticker that said, this inspires. And we asked people to stick it onto something that inspired them, take a picture of it, and upload it to a site, which everybody did. And we had a really nice time, I think, collectively doing this. This was the winner, Many Hands Make Light Work. Nature in the City, by Richard Sanders from the Center for Advancement of Steady State Economy. Sounds awesome. So innovation doesn't feel like that. Back to my chart at the beginning with my consultancy, it shouldn't feel like that. It's not much as I love the idea of an algebraic structure of equivalence or a homomorphism congruence relation subalgebra. I'm not sure that's going to really get any of us further into the future. So, last couple of slides. Back to you guys and back to tomorrow. How do we all do this? How do we all rebuild, rethink, and redesign Queensland together? What's the way forward in all of this? Some thoughts. Final thoughts. By the way, this is Brisbane. How awesome is this? Really nice picture. So first, as Tom said in his presentation, it is about identifying the right questions and framing them as opportunities. The reason why the Queensland Challenge worked so well was because we managed to simplify a complex topic and give people a hook in. How might we connect rural food production with urban food consumption? Bingo. Not, what's the problem with food? Nobody would have come with that. It's too huge, too expansive. So again, framing it as possibility and getting it to the right scale. Number two, it's about radical collaboration. Everybody working together, like we had in the workshop. Farmer working with student, government working with private, big working with small. It's about starting small and prototyping quickly. I cannot communicate how important this is. Big things don't have to have big answers. They can have very small answers. And they can be small collections of answers that are joined together. And again, nobody reacts to a concept on a piece of paper. Everybody wants to see it and touch it. Celebrate success and embrace failure. If I can show you Iceland, you can show me yours. So it's very important to be able to talk about failure. It's very important to celebrate failure as learning. This is one of the biggest inhibitors that we see in both our corporate and our governmental work, is fear of failure inhibits action. Connect the, lit connect the littles to become bigs. Again, the idea of joining small ideas together to make big ideas. We saw this again and again in the workshop we just did. How are all of these tiny ideas, and in fact, it was great to see everybody come to the same conclusion. All these small ideas add up to something very powerful. 
Measure the right things, as I was talking about before. Measure the right things so that you know what you're aiming for. And probably last and most importantly, close the gap between talking and doing. So everything that Tom said at the beginning of, of, of his talk as well is very important. Speed and agility is now the way forward. So 48 hours after Speak to Tweet was invented, Egypt was in a totally different political structure. So now the speed of everything is making us having to have to act in a different way. And I'm so excited about that. It excites me more than anything. Because we're dangling this huge carrot of change out in the world. Everybody's very excited about change. And yet, making change happen is actually quite difficult. And the faster and quicker you can close the gap between those two things, the better it is. So, this is a direct quote from the Q2 challenge. If we want to hold on to the Queensland life we love while creating a better future for our children and grandchildren, we must take early action on these and other challenges starting today, said Anna Blythe. So, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Do you want a seat, Stan? Stand. Stand. Questions? Um, questions from the floor. Um, just as an observation, one of the biggest obstacles to change is fear and uncertainty, and you've removed a lot of that. I think um, the energy in the air of all of us who are interested in getting forward, moving forward with this stuff is very exciting. Thank you. Come on. Questions? Bring it on. on. Yes. So you made a statement just towards the end there, and you actually made the same point throughout the presentation about connecting little to form big, mm -hmm. bringing lots of little to, to, to form big. I actually had a quote a couple of weeks ago um, that was sticking together feathers and hoping to get a duck. <laughs> and I, I actually wonder how, what, what your view is of that quote, because it's quite interesting, the idea of crowdsourcing, when you've got lots of people coming up with is lots of ideas. Is it a good thing ideas. to stick together feathers and get a duck or a bad thing? I don't well, hoping to get a duck. I don't right. think it really works like that, though. Apparently, that's not how ducks come about. Um, I mean, again, I think, I think you, need to know what, you need to know what the end game is going to be. You need to have a strategy. This is why I keep on talking about what are the things you're going to measure, what are the things you're working towards. You can't just run blindly with scissors towards the future and hope that it's going to happen. You've actually got to be somewhat deliberate about what you want that future to be. But it's where do you start that's very important. So to me, this is about connecting long-term with short-term. It's not about just running blindly. So, yes, I, sort of, I love the sticking many feathers together make a duck. You have to know you want to get a, towards a duck. You have to know what duckness looks like, if you want to use that metaphor. Um, so, we're, we are big fans in combining this world of trying to get our clients to think long-term or trying to get our sort of, you know, government clients to think about what is the long-term end goal, but how quickly, how cheaply, how soon can you start? So, I would say it's small, but not small and random. It's small and strategic, joined together are the things that I would actually try to bring those two worlds together. And I think on the opposite of that, I mean, again, we see, these, I see it all the time. Clients want these huge epoch-changing, molecular structure-changing strategies, and then they have absolutely no idea where to start with them. So they go the other end. They jump all the way into some absurd future, concept future, and then they can't start the ball rolling at all. So I think it's the, the interplay between the two. You're the, you're the picker of people. I don't yeah, want to pick. There's a hand up here in the um, black and white. Sure. Let's wait for the mic, everyone. Um, everything about society at the moment seems to tend towards complexity yes. rather than simplicity. So supermarkets will give you a docket that gets you four cents off at the service station and governments put in um, tolls on roads rather than increasing taxes, all of that sort of thing. Mm. How do we go about changing the incentives or somehow reversing that so that simpler and cleaner and more elegant is... Uh, a natural result. I mean, again, I, I, I hope what I'm about to say is not super directed or provocative, but somebody has to start leading a different conversation in a different way here somewhere so that other people can point to it and go, that's what I want. Everybody's trying to sort of copy what they think best practices are from everywhere else. It's just that everywhere else is often wrong. Right? So one of my clients said this great line to me once. He said, everybody spends all of their time trying to, trying to, trying to impress us and trying to give us the answer that they want us to hear. The problem is we have no idea what we want to hear and we have no idea what the question is. So they're all running towards something. They don't know what it is. So I am determined, in fact, I'm saying this deliberately, 
to get a government to start to, in, to do these things, to start to think differently, to start to incentivize itself differently, to start to create metrics inside its own organization that actually measure these things differently, and to lead by doing, and to start to put some of these examples out in the world. Because I couldn't agree with you more. I think so much of this is about following one another, and yet one another is not necessarily the right people to follow in most of these cases. Paul, on that, I've got a, a mm. question. In terms of, it's fantastic to have IDEO come in and facilitate this process. Yep. How do we, as groups, facilitate our own clusters as they develop? Again, I mean, I, I, I don't want to make what we do sound like algebra. It's just sit down and have some ideas. I mean, it's not complicated. I think what you need to decide to do is you need to decide to do something, not discuss something. You know, so again, you know, I'm a big believer and you have to decide on an outcome and then you figure out what, how you want to get the outcome to happen. So if you want to do X, then figure out how to do X. Rather than, I mean, again, Tom said it, there's a billion ideas out there. Executing the ideas is the difficult thing to do. So the thing that we did in the workshop, which is really exciting, was press everybody's feet to the fire about how do you launch this? Who has the checkbook? Who's, gonna, who's got the bus? Who has the school? Let's join these hands together, you know? So I think, again, it's not necessarily about adding more critical debate, it's adding critical doing to it that, that, uh, that I would like to see in all of these things. And presumably that's where your idea is interest in social enterprise and other enterprise work is... We are, yeah, again, we, we, you know, the idea, for those of you that don't know, idea is 25 years old and we started life as a product design consultancy and for us, I think the, t the, the, the microcosmic core of what we do is making stuff real. So we don't like jazz hand kind of, you know, worlds where everybody describes this conceptual shadow puppetry. To us, it's like, how can you make it literally with your hands? So I think for us, this sort of guiding meme of, of tangibility is, is, where, is why we got into this space, because we didn't want to discuss change, we wanted to change stuff. So, yes. Uh, we'll stick on this side and then we'll go to the gentleman over here in the white shirt first. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. You're welcome, thank you. Uh, my name's Luke Hayes and my question is about a disaster recovery network framework yes. that I've designed. Yeah. Um, it's a scalable local community network and mm -hmm. uh, community services uh, directory mm -hmm. that will enable people to locate all of the real-time information that they need awesome. mm -hmm. uh, for planning and before a disaster and recovering yep. after a disaster. My question is, um, do you think government or business or crowdsourcing would be a better, uh, which would be the best way of All of the getting above. funding? All of the above, holding hands. All of the above, you need everything. I mean, I think now you need kind of top down, middle and bottom all to be working together. Um, you know, if I had to pick, I would say cr crowd. I mean, I would definitely start with kind of getting well, as many people. I've there. already got something on plan big and now that I'm aware of your network, I was going to put my three plans onto audio. Awesome, well, yeah. One, one's a disaster recovery network, one's a community idea solicitation device like the Ideas Festival, and the yep. other is a framework for a 100% free digital education and information network. Hallelujah, brother. Boom. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, again, I, I'm a big believer that the broader the platform, you know, the more the impact. Um, you know, and so if you can throw, I mean, again, like we're doing ourselves, if you can throw that out into the world, I, I firmly believe that in the power of human kindness and people want to spread good ideas. If you have a good idea, people will spread it for you. So the broader the broader of the group that you can start with, the better, you know. And in terms of disaster recovery, I mean, you know, I'm obsessed with that at the moment. We have a colleague, we have two colleagues who've just opened an office for us in Japan or have opened a satellite office for us in Japan and they opened three days after the earthquake hit there. So we're desperately trying to figure out how to mobilize and have that conversation there in a way that's generative and how to support them. So for us, this whole space of kind of coming in at the right time with positive and optimistic tools rather than just sort of freaking out is something we're trying to figure out for both here and for Japan as well. Over here. Yeah. Perhaps this is a bit of a sticky question. I can't hear you, I'm oh, sorry. sorry. Can you speak Perhaps up? this is a bit of a, a sticky question, but uh, you mentioned uh, before your experience with the Icelandic government. Uh -huh. And um, I'm just wondering, uh, do you find yourselves, when, uh, when you're working with a government organisation, say such as Queensland State Government, sure. that um, because of perhaps, okay, things perhaps like vested interests, say, in the mining industry, this sort of thing, um, where you might find your um, terms of reference are somewhat limited, even if it's like a, a kind of like a white elephant in the room where you can't, where you might find yourself restricted. In term, so you might get a better result after going through all these processes, but it's still actually a suboptimal result. Yeah. Um, and if so, how do you get around that? 
Um, I'll be quite frank. Uh, for example, there's a, a, a meeting tomorrow uh, uh, by a group called uh, Friends of Felton, and they're very concerned about the fracking process and uh, calcium gas extraction and the impact on the <coughs> water supply and therefore also the impact on our local food production here, right, which is right. connected to something you're working on. Sure. So issues like that, you know, I mean, we find, you know, many, many active groups find themselves restricted by vested interests who keep mm -hmm. just uh, putting misinformation out, that kind of thing. And in your interaction with working with, gov you know, governments like this, is it just a white elephant in the room or are they starting to get more receptive to looking at truly long-term alternative I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story. I told this story the last time I was here. I'll tell it again. It's a Dubai story. I was in Dubai doing that TED talk that I told you about, and um, there was a white elephant in the room there. We had a brainstorm about an hour before I went on stage, and I asked the local community, what's your dream for Dubai? And as I actually didn't allude to it on the thing here, women, particularly in this instance, were, um, were, were covered and were posting in a very sort of specific way points like this and backing away. And our translator, Natasha, said, let this happen, let it happen. And so we let this happen for about 20 minutes. At the end of 20 minutes, she started pulling off post-it notes, and she said, this is really interesting. This is women talking about inequality. This is women talking about feeling marginalized. This is about gender issues here. This is, a re this is something people want to say. And so I thought, right. So on stage, I read them out. And I didn't read them out sort of casting judgment. I just said, this is very interesting that you are having this conversation with one another. We are simply here to, to, to highlight this. So at the end of my talk, this lady came over to me, and she said, um, the princess would like to meet you. And I thought, shit, what have I done? You know, I thought I'd, I thought I'd really offended somebody. Um, long story short, it was um, one of the Jordanian royal family. It was Princess Reem Ali of Jordan. She's one of Noor's um, sisters. And she said, really interesting that you said that. And she said, I'm really interested in how you were able to say things like that. I think people like you need to say these things because you're not coming from an agenda of politics. You're coming from a different agenda. Her quote, not mine. You have the agenda, the politics of optimism. And I think design, her words again, not mine, design is about optimism. That's why I said that at the beginning. So I think it allowed us to have a conversation that wasn't inflammatory, but was trying to unearth an issue, but in a way that said, how do we design past it, rather than sit there with it in the middle of the table and try to ignore it. So I think you know, often we get involved in these quite complicated conversations where we have cans of worms and elephants in rooms, and you can't design past them unless you discuss them, but you can't discuss them in a way that's judgmental. You have to discuss them in a way that's sort of optimistic and moving forward. So I'm not, sure that's the, I'm not sure that's the best answer, but it's certainly the closest answer that I've had is when we've got up against the political system, and I was in China recently and having lots of conversations about what that could look like there, you have to be one about, you have to A, listen, and you B, have to be optimistic, and you have to design past those things rather than sitting there with some kind of agenda-laden room, which doesn't really help. Time for one more question. This guy's had his hand up from the very beginning, so it has to be him. Hello. Um, Paul, you've spoken a lot about taking action, yes. and I want to ask you, as an organisation, IDEO, when do you step away from an idea and then leave it to your client to actually mm -hmm. execute that? And Depends. Sorry, go ahead. And then, is there any way that then you can go back and, and affect change again? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very varied. I mean, sometimes, and increasingly, so we were talking about this at dinner last night, it's increasingly earlier in the, in the equation because our clients are more equipped to be able to take these things forward than ever before. Clients have developed a sensitivity to these kinds of things now, but not in all cases. Um, so that's very much on dependent on the client, on the sector, on the problem, on the level of kind of in, you know, insight inside the organization. We try wherever possible. It's what I said about you don't own the, you, you can't own it. We don't really work for our clients. We work with our clients. We're very partnerial throughout. And I think often our clients and us have a relationship where they feel comfortable. I mean, Tom's one of the best people at doing this in having us as being an ongoing advisory relationship. So if something needs happened, we go in there. But there's nothing worse than a disempowered organization that feels like you've swooped and pooped from the outside and they're suddenly, you know, left. We don't do that. Um, so, you know, I don't like seagull, it's seagull management, I think. I don't like that idea of seagull management, to sort of <laughs> run off you go. So we try very, very hard to be integrative into our clients' businesses. I guess that my next comment then was that sounds like, a very, like very much integrating the design process into business. 
Yeah, I mean, design process and business are the same thing. It's how do you, well, hopefully, it's how do you identify what's going on in the world that you can help make people's lives better and transact value through doing so. To a certain, that's what we do. That's what a business is. Thank well, you. I think proving that um, Thank you. small times many equals big. Um, thanks very much, Paul Bennett. Thank you. And thanks to all the audio guys.